So I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the new project that we're working on, but also to try to give you a flavor for um, where the project fits into the bigger picture of what we've been working towards for probably the last four or five years. Um, and I'd like to begin the story with, um, with the web. Um, now, in my mind, the web um, should really be um, a, a platform that in some sense transforms society. And I guess in many respects, that has been, that's been the case. It's certainly transformed the high street um, from one filled with record stores to one filled with cafes. Um, but I fear that it really hasn't um, achieved what it really could have done. So when we think about the web, what do we mean? And I kind of identified two things. The first thing is that it's access to information. And um, as, uh, you know, as David's talk just before me was um, sort of uh, pointing towards, um, that information is um, not always the best uh, information, not always so accurate. Um, and it's very difficult with the web as it stands um, to really understand um, things like how accurate the information is, what its provenance is, where it comes from, um, whether it's actually true or not, whether it's valid. Um, and then folding things back on itself, my information is also very difficult with the web as it stands to really understand what my information, um, what it is, where it's going, who's holding on to it, um, and who else gets hold of it, and potentially what for. Um, how many people have read a, um, a website's privacy policy in full before clicking the OK button? Hands up. Two, three, four. I rest my case. Um, there's a lot missing. It does what, what, it, what we need it to do at the moment, but there's a lot missing from the web. So what else is it? Well, the other thing I identified that the web is, is access to the economy. So what do I mean by the economy? I mean basically any, any transaction where value is transferred. Um, now, the thing is with the web, if you think about it, although we do shopping and banking and whatnot on it, actually, the web itself doesn't support these things natively. Actually, um, the web only supports data or at best information. Um, it doesn't support economic activity. If we want to actually make any kind of economic activity, then we simply have to construct some information or some data and go to a trusted authority a middleman, an intermediary, who will um, effectively make economic action on our behalf. So when I do banking, for example, I log into my bank's website. And it's, I tell my bank, hey, I would like to transfer some money over here. And if the bank's having a good day and they, they decide that they like me, then they might actually carry out that action for me. Sometimes they don't. In this respect, the web is not really behaving as a transformative platform. In this respect, it's actually behaving as a proxy for pre-existing social relationships. And that's kind of a shame. Um, in my mind, um, one of the great promises of the internet was to reshape society into something that actually sort of re-empowers us away from the, the standing status quo and institutions of society. So we come to um, Web3. So Web3. As a, as a sort of vision, if you like, came up quite early on in the Ethereum project, where I was trying to think about how Ethereum um, really could uh, deliver utility to people over and above allowing scripts to exist on something a bit like Bitcoin. And Web3 is the rest of the picture, if you like. Um, it, it takes Ethereum as a, as a central part, but it also builds um, uh, several other technologies around it, and not to mention, of course, a presentation layer um, something that we're all fairly, very familiar with, the idea of a web browser presenting us with HTML, CSS formatted stuff and making everything go very nice with JavaScript. Now, for Web3 to work, um, we need to change the model from where we are at the moment, which is as I want to climb a mountain or do some particular task, I have to rely on the web basically connecting me with someone else who can uh, deliver me uh, along that journey. With Web3, if the, if the mission is successful, then I will no longer need that other person, and I will be able to conduct that journey on my own with these great tools that we're developing. 
So in some sense, Web3 is the idea of the web, except we want to remove um, these incumbent authorities, or indeed the pattern of ha necess necess necessitating incumbent authorities in order to get the jobs that we want done, done. Now, to build the applications that we're used to, the Facebooks and the Twitters, the Amazons and the, the Googles, we need a number of, of components. And this is one of the sort of things that was that we identified very early on um, in the sort of um, iteration of what Web3 really could be. So the four components are user interfacing or something like the presentation layer, which we all sort of more or less understand as being the bit of the browser that actually displays stuff to us. Um, and then three more bits of technology. Static publication, which is basically just, hey, there's some data and I want to get access to that data. Um, someone else wants to provide me with the data, but we may not be online at the same time. We may not know each other's sort of hardware addresses. We may not know how to contact each other. So we need to somehow place the data into this um, cloud. Cloud's not quite the right word. That's got a different technical meaning. But into this sort of cloud of, um, of, of, of um, IT and so that someone else at maybe some later point can actually access it, and furthermore, knowing, know that they're getting exactly the same information that was uploaded in the first place. Second thing is dynamic messaging. This is basically where we allow um, different individuals, different identities to actually message each other. Now, both of these things should be done with, obviously, um, guarantees that they're going to be working correctly. It's no good. Um, sort of developing this stuff and then actually it turns out that it's pretty flaky and sometimes when you send a message to someone it doesn't go through or it does go through but it's the wrong information, it gets corrupted, whatever. Um, and when I say corrupted, I'm talking on a fairly philosophical level, I view um, the government intercepting and changing the data to also be a, a type of corruption. And the final thing is expectation management and this is probably one of the hardest things um, to do. So when I, when I mean expectation management, um, what I'm kind of talking about is a sort of civil law, except natively on the internet. So civil law is, is great. I mean, normal law is great as well. Uh, but civil law is, is kind of cool because we can, we can make it do more or less what we want it to do, within certain boundaries and limitations, of course. But we can, we can write these things called contracts, and these contracts can allow us to um, come to some potentially multi-party um, arrangement for the management of expectations. Right? So, for example, if I enter into a rent um, agreement with a landlord, then the landlord can, be, can reasonably expect that they will get paid some money every month, and I can reasonably expect that I'll have somewhere to stay. Um, and this is what I mean by expectation management. Now, at the moment, to get expectation management on the internet, we have to kind of appeal to some particular jurisdiction's civil law, or <laughs> to trust. Um, but um, how many people would trust someone they met on the internet 10 minutes ago? Wow, you guys, you <laughs> How many people have been ripped off on the internet? <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, we've developed a system for expectation management that's native to the internet. We call it the blockchain. This is my... Um, um, my mashup of like artists' impression of what the blockchain is. Um, it's <laughs> uh, the uh, the Cartman in the middle is really there to signify the authority of the blockchain. Respect my authority, right? The, that's what the blockchain says. Um, and of course, the a pluribus unum is the idea that that many um, uh, many sort of what would you call them? Uh, uh, partially incentivized, but otherwise uh, nodes with non-aligned interests can come together as a plurality and form a single, um, a single uh, uh, system of, of where a rule of law, or, or at least rules, are, um, are, are, are sort of guaranteed. And we can also call this the world computer. It's got lots of different names. It's very good. Um, now, this is a little bit more useful to us because with the world computer, we can understand that the way that information and interaction in this system works is stuff comes from the outside and it makes its way into the bubble, the bubble of the blockchain. And once interaction, once events are inside the blockchain, it's very difficult to get them out again. 
at least in a trust-free manner. When I say trust-free manner, I mean a manner in which case we don't have to go to some predetermined, predefined authority and ask, please, sir or madam, will you allow me to do this particular transaction? And that's problematic. So why is it problematic? Um, in principle, it leads to a couple of, um, what would you call them, uh, artifacts of interaction. And the artifacts are closely resembling those that problematic aspects of, uh, that I will call problematic, of m modern society. Modern society sort of has this um, uh, notion of having to appeal to authority, and in some sense, because the blockchains tend to exist in a bubble, you have to appeal to the particular authority of the blockchain that you're interested in. And once you're committed to that, it's very difficult to get outside of it. Um, this is um, made worse uh, by the notion of economic exclusivity of these systems, of these bubble systems. For example, if you're um, heavily invested in Bitcoin, then you'll very much dislike, um, well, there are people who are heavily invested in Bitcoin that very much dislike other blockchains, and it seems to be something that's fairly pervasive. Similarly, if you're heavily invested in Ethereum, there's some degree of, of uh, sort of nationalism or maximalism whereby you, you prefer that other blockchains are generally not used. And this is kind of problematic in that respect. Um, it leads to barriers, at least to the same barriers that we have in society where um, if you're dealing with um, within country X, it's actually very costly and difficult to move that, that dealings into country Y. You also get elite ruling groups forming. Um, and this again is kind of to do with barriers and the bubble uh, aspect of it all. Um, and this leads to sort of fairly dodgy governance um, decisions sometimes bad decisions become being made for, the, for, for really the wrong reasons. Um, and and you, get some, you, get, you start to get um, the, uh, the centralization artifacts occurring. So the project that I want to sort of um, very quickly mention, I've only got three minutes, um, is uh, called Polkadot. There it is, T-shirt. Um, and the idea is to really break down these barriers. So um, Polkadot's really three things. Let's go back. First thing. Um, is uh, to, to allow invention, to allow experimentation to happen uh, much easier than it can at the moment. We want to like, um, make this into sort of um, uh, innovation, turbocharged uh, commons. Oh dear. Ah, okay, those are the questions, are they? Um, uh, and uh, this is like, at the moment, it's very difficult to uh, develop, deploy, and secure um, a new blockchain, a new one of these um, internet native civil law bubbles. And we want to make that much easier. Um, the next thing is really to take existing um, chains, which are, again, bubbles in the internet native civil law uh, notion, and allow them to speak to each other without having to trust intermediaries. To really break down the barrier, the cell wall, uh, that these things um, uh, live inside. And Polkadot really uh, is, is, is very much designed around this so that we can um, allow the, the messages and generic transactions to be sent between these things um, so that we can build a real sort of network of these up, allowing each one to deliver what they need to deliver to their particular um, um, uh, stakeholders, but still allow um, the, the utility of them to be available um, to each other. And finally, um, to really secure them as one. So at the moment, these bubbles, these chains, when they need to be secured, it's typically um, a competition. So for one to become more secure, pretty much means that another is becoming less secure in the same way. Um, with, uh, with the system that they're developing, with Polkadot, it's possible to actually allow them to cooperate so that as more people come in, they can secure each other, and they both hold each other to the rules that they've published. And this is really the first step towards being able to process all of those transactions in the world under one kind of roof, um, the problem that we call scalability. OK, that's the talk. The mic, I've got 30 seconds left. I think I can take like um, maybe one question or something. Thank you so much. Give a Cheers. big round of applause. I think we're going to do one question because we're, uh, we're very tight on time. 
If you don't mind, I'm going to pick the one with the, with the top up votes. How do you see the latest drop in Ethereum course and how do you see the main, oh, uh, the many ICOs? The latest drop in the ETH. Ah, okay, in terms I, of the, I believe uh, that's the what price, it says. presumably. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, markets are volatile, markets are fickle. Um, I don't really see it as being um, um, particularly significant. I mean, okay, if it were a six month moving average and we looked at it, then I think uh, we're still sort of vaguely going up, so whatever. Um, the ICOs, I think, are, are very demonstrative of, a, um, of, the, of the at least current um, uh, killer feature that Ethereum has, has, has sort of demonstrated. I mean, Bitcoin, we did a crowd sale on Bitcoin and it was like fucking nightmare. Um, it's, it's really not built for being able to take many stakeholders and then sort of uh, turning it into a, uh, a, you know, a sale and then a currency. Um, Ethereum really sort of um, facilitates that. And I think it's fairly demonstrative of, uh, of, its, of its power that you know, so, so early on, um, there's a very clear uh, use case. But I think like the internet, it won't be a, uh, a single use case. You know, the internet was originally sort of Usenet, hey, and then it was email. And then it was like the web, and then it's like Facebook and whatever. So I think we'll see, you know, an iteration. But this looks like it's the initial, um, the initial thing that's getting people excited. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's do one quick question. Even though blockchain decentralizes the economy to allow transfers, we still need a network like Coinbase to buy and sell. Mm. Yeah. Can't read that sentence, but I, I think you understood the question. Um, yeah, it, I mean it's true, and it's one of the big, one of the big annoyances, right? Um, we've we've got this this great sort of bubble, but at the moment the things that you can do inside the bubble um, are fairly small. The things that you have to rely on the outside of the bubble, the old traditional um, authority-based, intermediary-based world, uh, is still fairly powerful. You still have to go there. So, I mean, that's where a lot of the newer um, uh, technologies are coming in. They're saying, right, well. Um, for example, uh, Polkadot says, right, well, let's connect, uh, connect the blockchains together, and then suddenly you don't actually have to go to an exchange to exchange two different cryptos. You can do it natively on the blockchains, because the blockchains can send a transaction between each other saying, hey, uh, I transferred um, this currency to this place, so you can now transfer that currency to that place. You can do an atomic swap. And I think this is really where, um, where we're going to sort of be able to build on what we have. Um, in addition, of course, to going deeper into the bubble and starting to build out technologies like you know, state channels, which will allow um, substantially greater um, uh, transaction throughput. So um, yes, we do still need these, um, these kind of old school, um, traditional um, uh, uh, sort of institutions. But uh, you know, the future, uh, I think, holds um, some disruption for them. Wonderful. Gavin, thank you so very much for being here. Cheers. A big hand of applause. Thank you.